dear friend and collaborator, and I said, wouldn't it be exciting to work on a production of Once on this Island, a musical that I have loved for many years, and create a version that we could do in a parking lot? I wanted to show how people could tell stories and make music using just what they might have at hand, and how the power of storytelling sort of needs nothing other than the human spirit. So I went to the authors, Stephen Flaherty and Lynn Ahrens, and I said, hey, I want to do your show. I want to do it a cappella. It could be in a parking lot. Uh, and I had put together some demos with Anne-Marie Milazzo. Friends gathered together, and we made these a cappella versions of a couple of the songs. Wrote a beautiful letter, gave it to the writers, and they immediately said, no, you can't do this. We were skeptical because he didn't have any Broadway credits at the time other than as an actor, and also because we didn't think that the show would work a cappella. Being true to myself, I, I didn't let no be the answer. I kept coming back to them, and after I had opened Spring Awakening on Broadway, our producer, Ken Davenport, said, what do you want to do next, and immediately said, once on this island. I said, oh my gosh, I love that show. I've loved it for so long, let's do it. Uh, and I called the authors literally the next day and said, I want to get you in the room with Michael Arden. I want you to hear his vision uh, for Once on this Island. Their response was not, yes, let's go for it and do it. You know, you always dream, or sometimes the movie version would be exactly that. Things tend to move a little bit slower. And very smartly, those authors said, we love Once on this Island. Once on this Island was one of their first babies uh, and a very treasured piece for them. So they wanted to hear what the vision was. When we went into the meeting, there were sets, there were designs and, and um, visual material and uh, a whole long discussion about his concept for the show and we were completely, completely won over. Revivals are so much about how you're going to present it, right? Why is it going to be relevant today? The focus becomes on how do we take what is usually a revered piece of material, something that has been proven to audiences and that audiences love, but that was perhaps written many, many years ago, and making it resonate with a modern audience. Why tell this story today? Musicals that were written in the 50s and 60s and 70s, if you did them exactly as is, they may not have the same resonance uh, today as they did when they were originally produced because the people are going through different things in their lives. at a place in time and in the world where injustice is eradicated and walls have all been broken down. I mean, we have a, we have a president who keeps threatening to put one up. So I think, unfortunately, you know, some stories need to be told and told and told. <laughs> Revival means that a play has stood the test of time. Death of a salesman, a raisin in the sun, long day's journey into night. And you know, time changes, but people pretty much stay the same. We have the same sort of challenges, you know. And I'm hoping one day, you know, we'll figure it out, like what it really means to be a decent human being. And we're still figuring out how to be respectful of each other, how to live on the planet together. And some of the great works of art, some of these wonderful plays, to sort of find ways to help us articulate that in different ways. Did you're not going home anymore after you were 18, did that have anything to do with your sister's friends, the boys that you were going out with? Let me help you, damn it. How? By showing you the joys of sex with a hearing man. Children of a Lesser God is a play that most people know the title because of the film, not because of the play. I saw the play on Broadway in 1980. 
and it has always been on uh, my dream list to bring that play back to Broadway. And I was fortunate enough to be introduced to Kenny Leon, who uh, shared that vision. And since that conversation four years ago, uh, the world has changed in, in so many ways, which has shown all of us that people just do not listen to other people. Sarah, what if you and I left here together? What if Above everything, this is a play about love, but it's also about uh, what strengthens the love is we gotta listen to each other and we're, we're just not doing that. So I, in that sense, I think it's a very universal play. You would get unscared. What would you do? You can do whatever you want to do. So, what do you want to do? Teach in a deaf school, that is possible. Come on, what else do you want? You want me, well you've got me. Come on, too late to stop now. What else? Children. Deaf children. Children of a Lesser God was originally written in 1978 by uh, the author Mark Medoff. It came about because Mark uh, and his good friend Robert Steinberg were teaching sign language to deaf students. And Robert was married to the then actress Phyllis Freelich, who was born deaf. And Robert at one point said to Mark, who was a fledgling playwright at the time, why don't you write a play for my wife? Because there are plays for deaf actresses. Hence, Children of a Lesser God was born. It then opened to critical acclaim and moved to Broadway and won the Tony Award. And the winner is Children of a Lesser God. Dream meets reality. I use a sign in the play. It means to be joined in a shared relationship. Thank you. Mark allowed us to look at it through fresh lens and make it contemporary. You don't know which there were things that were in the play that quite frankly now, in today's climate of harassment and women's rights and things like that were a little bit off color and, and off putting and he gladly looked at those lines and, and uh, made, took some of them out and changed some of them and things like that. Our second nominated musical is Once on this Island. A return to the most intimate kind of theatrical magic. This joyous musical creates a mythical Caribbean island and there weaves the tale of a beautiful young girl who is sent on a journey by the gods of her island to prove the strength of love. Here now, Tony nominee Lachance and her co-stars, the cast of Once on this Island.
Once on this island, in a terrible storm, two lovers met. The gods looked down, and a beautiful story began. Once on this island is loosely based on Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. It's about a girl who believes she's been saved by the gods, saved for something special. She finds uh, a boy who has been hurt, and she believes that it is her duty to heal this boy. And just the idea that love can conquer death, love can heal. And it's sort of ultimately about classism and colorism, ultimately racism. The good that we do in our lives, and what Timun, our lead character, does in her life, and, and, and the risks she takes, and the fact that she trusts love over fear and, and over sort of the constraints of society, echoes on and lives on after her death. And I think. For Once in on This Island, one of the reasons that made it so timely was looking at the incredible amounts of natural disasters that have uh, occurred over the last several years and, and how they destroyed so many communities and then how those communities rebuilt themselves after the effects of these great storms. That's what we thought would resonate when we layered that on top of the story of Once on this Island. at it through the lens of a world that has been through quite a terrible disaster. Designer Dan Laffrey and I traveled to Haiti and did research there. I had never been to a place so devastated. And so it was really interesting and really informed what we're doing on stage. When while we were in rehearsal, hurricanes were happening in Florida and in Houston. And we were interested in showing how people rebuild because so much of the world has been forced to rebuild and in the past few years. Such tenderness, the ones 27 years ago, Stephen and I had had our first show produced. And when it closed, we, we started looking for the next project. And I was browsing around in a bookstore and, there, and I saw this beautiful little colorful, slim volume and I pulled it out. And it was called My Love, My Love or The Peasant Girl. That was the title. And the words just on the first page just struck me so, so emotionally. Um, the words were, there is an island where rivers run deep, where the sea sparkling in the sun earns it the name Jewel of the Antilles. And I thought, oh my God, this sounds like a musical. It sounds like that should be a song. And I bought the book for $1.50 and I went home and I read it in about an hour. And I called Stephen, I said, I'm coming over, and I got a cab, took the book, and brought it to him, and I said, I think this is our next show. There is an island where rivers run deep. Where the sea, sparkling in the sun, earns it the name Jewel of the Antilles. I had been, just for fun, listening to a lot of Afro-Caribbean beats, South American music, sambas, also uh, American gospel. And I thought, since the, the novel wasn't placed in any particular island, I could really create my own sound world. There's something very percussive about the score, and you always wanted to be that. And there was something about when you're sitting at your piano that, uh, you know, you're very sedentary. And I thought, I have to get up and move and, and feel the, the rhythm in my body. So I would be uh, walking through Manhattan and I'd be singing as I'd be going along. I pretty much wrote the entire score on my feet, and then I would run home to my apartment, leap at the piano, and then I would try to record it and transcribe it. I had to really imagine what this world sounded like in my head. I approach all revivals the same. I approach them like they are new plays, and I think about what I want to leave this present-day audience with. With this production of Children of a Lesser God, unlike 40 years ago when it was originally produced, which was all white Americans uh, doing all of the roles, this production is cast uh, multiracially. 
I'm a stronger director because of this specific play. In my rehearsal room, I have, what, three interpreters, I have three actors who are deaf, I have hearing actors, I have uh, all the different racial makeup in the room. Hello, I left you a note. It said, please see me this afternoon. I will bring in the boxing gloves. Because of the fact that Sarah is now being played by a young black woman, and she has a black mom, we are exploring kind of the cultural um, underpinnings of the play. African-American culture is a little different than Anglo culture in terms of how we raise our children. It's not always safe for brown children in this culture. We have to learn how to speak two languages, if you will. And I would imagine that that's especially difficult for a deaf person. You have to navigate a world in which you are seen a certain way just because of your color. There are assumptions made because of your color and how you have to overcome those assumptions and very often overachieve in order just to have a seat at the table. So we're kind of adding that in as well. Flaherty and Lynn Aarons is really a, a lifelong dream. I listened to their cast albums and saw their shows, and here I am arguing with them over something now. <laughs> with a revival, you're not rewriting so much as watching it be reconceived by other artists. And in a way, it makes you more nervous because you can't control it as much as you can. When you're, when you're writing an original musical, you know, the writer is, is the ultimate authority. We own our words, we own our music. In the case of a revival, we've done that work already. So really, it's our job to sit there and, and be the concerned parents, saying, you know, this, this is a really good show, don't mess it up. It's difficult for writers who have written something and worked on it with a director in the past, creating it and making it exactly how they see it, to then years later revisit it and have someone else sort of tear it apart and put it back together again. Ah, Michael Arden really wanted to not deconstruct. He, he was very faithful to the original tunes and the original lyrics, which we have not changed. But in terms of the how-to of the piece, the idea of pushing the idea of storytellers and story circles even further, he came up with the notion that it should be done in the round. They'd never seen it with the entire audience as part of the circle of storytelling. gods that are a part of Once on this Island, some of them are based on actual real gods, so it's really about understanding the African tradition and that culture and really bringing that in. I was going to watch the show, um, and I decided to just watch one number just to get a feel, and then I said that was enough because I wanted to make sure that all of the ideas, the discoveries, the feeling, the language was coming from my voice, and I didn't want to be influenced, and I also wanted to honor what Graciela did as her own choreographer and then step into my own voice as well. Oh, God, oh, God, hear my prayer. We had had an early meeting, and they had the notion that what if it was nothing but human voices, human bodies, and even instruments. Could you make an instrument out of junk? What if we made marimbas and xylophones out of broken pieces of tile and glass and wood? The idea of making something of beauty from something that is a cast-off, I thought was actually quite profound. In this revival, the character that I originated, Asaka, the mother of the earth, was played by a man. Just being able to experience that role in a way that would be more open to trans people, to see that possibility, it's very exciting. And it, and it expands, I think, people's thinking. <laughs>
gods didn't need to be defined by gender, by race, that people could come to the show, kids especially could come to the show and look up and see themselves reflected back and say, oh my gosh, that's me, and feel proud about that. And as a gay man myself, I found that really, really exciting. Okay, then tell it to me right, so I will know what I'm talking about. I like the words, they're, they're classical, you know, uh, or it's just another production of this play. Uh, but revival sounds like something old, and how do you make it fresh for a new generation? Sometimes it means you just work more with the technology. Sometimes it means you bring the play closer to the audience. Sometimes it means you add sound. Uh, to the production of music. Sometimes it means you cast it in a different way. You cast it the way the world looks now. Um, so it's always creative and energetic ways to, uh, to make work fresh for today. There's something about this whole new generation experiencing the show that's thrilling to me. Our, our, our audiences are very mixed. There are many, many young people, very, very ethnically diverse. I just find it really exciting and, and humbling to know that this thing that we created all these many years ago is now breathing this new life and really, really speaking in a very direct and emotional way to contemporary audiences. One of the reasons I produce theater is to help develop the next generation of audiences for the future. Uh, my mom tells me that I first kicked when she was watching a production of Godspell, so I got into it very young. Uh, but we know now, it is a fact, that people that attend the theater late in life, people that support the theater, invest in the theater, write checks to nonprofit theater, these are the people that were exposed to it very young and actually participate in it very young. So when I see families bringing their children and when I hear children gasping or cheering or asking their parents questions or wanting to go see an actor to get their autograph, uh, I know that we've done our job and that that child is going to grow up and hopefully bring their children to the theater, uh, which guarantees that the theater not only survives the next hundred years, but that the theater thrives over the next hundred years.